the kind of like the, what it was a, a, about four or five hundred thousand people there, not now, it's getting close to a million. But you know the old DC, when uh, no matter what set you was on, you could uh, get around and know people from other little sets. You know what I mean? Well, that's the way Oakland was. Oakland, was, yeah, you hung out in your neighborhood, but it was not so big that you know you wouldn't have a feel for what's going on in the rest of the city. I'm gonna try to speed up. Anyway. So they tried to divert me. Now the thing about Oakland was, well, all the cities at that time, the people that just come from the South and all that were kind of semi-religious a little bit. You know, everybody, now we was from the middle class area in Oakland, and everybody was thinking, man, that you're gonna get in trouble, you know. And, and if you do that, you know, of course they all smoke through the weed mostly, but still, man, you're gonna get in trouble and this is gonna happen. And after a couple of years of watching, they were converted themselves. In other words, they said the time was moving. If you take 66, by 68, in those days, a year or two was a long time. So from 1966 to 1968, that was a big transition in the people. So the people watching. Now this is about risk. Oh, you selling this and you doing that. And look, it ain't too much of a risk in, in, at all. So pretty soon the people is getting, uh, you know, they starting to do it too. So by 68, the first group of people that was now getting involved in all of this modern, uh, you know, they started to sell drugs a little bit. Whereas before in 66, oh, the Lord going to get you and, you know, stuff like that. They was, that was really our neighborhood feeling, you know. But by 68, everybody's getting down. So the thing about risk and risk management is, if you don't take a chance in life or in anything, or in acting or in sports, you know, you don't take a risk. You know, even in track, they said it, fastest runners, why Negroes run so fast is because they lean so far forward and they're almost falling down. So they have no, they have to run, keep their feet moving because they, 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 that's part of our, our feeling, you know what I mean? That we lean, you see them running, when they, they lean in so far forward. They're not running straight up like white folks. Negroes is leaning forward. So you got to run fast to keep from falling down. That's technically, that's what it is. That, that, that's basically one of the things. And that's why Denzel said, if you gotta fall, fall forward, instead of falling backwards, because everybody tells you, you gotta have something to fall back on. Or you going to school, uh, you gonna take up this, but you better have something to fall back on. You know, everybody, is avoiding risk. And risk is what builds you. Risk is what makes you. So, no, we, we have to be able to take a chance. If you don't take a chance, you know. Uh, so, when we left Oakland, by 1971, it was a whole society of risk takers. Why? Because we lived, uh, like we talk, in a fishbowl life. We was living on the surface. Everybody, when you drive down the street, as your neighbors, everybody see each other and everybody, you know what I mean, everybody's in touch with each other. I mean, really in touch with each other. So, they get the feel and wait, if he can do all of that, then I can do it too. 
So if you look in, Cal in Northern California, Oakland for a long time, East Oakland, we talk about East Oakland Enterprises, a lot of the biggest Negroes, including Felix Mitchell and all of them, uh, they came out of uh, East Oakland. Why? Because we was there, I was gone, I was overseas running around. And about taking risk, I asked everybody. Uh, some of the people I was telling, well, I'm going to get out of here. And uh, you want to go with me? I was even telling my family, y'all want to go with me? Yeah, what about the house? And I said, okay. Everybody, you know, what about my mama and all the family? Yeah, okay, fine. I'm going. I'm not going to leave. I'm going to leave you hooked up, but I'm getting out of here because boss man is out of hand. Okay, so people are risk avoiders. They, they avoid risk. They don't want to take a chance. Now, when I travel all over the world, all of a sudden, I'm acquiring, uh, you know, and, and, and believe it or not, Negroes was kind of loose in those days. So you'd be calling everybody on the phone, oh, where you at? Oh, I'm in such and such, and I'm here, and I'm there. So everybody know where you are. So everybody's talking about it. So and so's in Africa. So and you gotta imagine, 50 years ago, how many blacks, only a few educated blacks and stuff, went to Africa. You know, do a little research, or go back to the motherland. It was all kind of. It was a whole group of uh, educated uh, Negro. They was. They was. Uh, semi-educated and in black Africa, not Algeria. In Algeria they was, you know, revolutionaries, or trying to be revolutionaries. But in black Africa, like Tanzania and all that, everybody was, uh, uh, some of the guys that was here, Hadari and them, that was at the, at the bookstore, they, they knew a lot of the people, they went to the, some of the big conferences they would have over there. You know, and uh, and uh, Tanzania, because anyway. But now, when we got to South America, that risk taken and imagine it, it's actually would be considered to everybody a big risk. You know, you don't know nothing about South. You going down to South America? Because, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Now imagine the average mind wouldn't even think about that. You can tell because there's no Negro uh, great smugglers of uh, any drugs. They ain't no uh, colored uh, cartels. They don't have them. They just some people pretty big in distribution here. They're not that many, that big in distribution, because other people are crowding in, coming in closer and closer on what would, would have been ours. So the point is, nobody wanted to take a chance. But when people would come down to South America and they'd come back here and then they would be rich overnight, then everybody wanted to come down in there. Because they saw the risk is worth it. Ain't nobody getting arrested. It's got to be easy. In fact, it was easy at that time. So, all of a sudden you see now people have taken a risk and just to come down there. Because people be seeing skeleton and closet, they be worried. What's going on? Where is South America at anyway? <laughs> you know, that's the first question. Come out of Where's Colombia? You got to realize that the Negro didn't travel that much in those days. They just didn't travel. No, I'm telling you, they didn't travel hardly at all. Black people, they used to roll their eyes at you when you went to get a passport. <laughs> what do a nigga need with a passport? Is what the white folks are saying. And, that's a, and it's still almost like that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Where are you going? What, where are you going? You leaving here from? We tell y'all all, but we want to find out about all that. You ask us, we we'll tell you. That's the way to look at it. Let me speed up a little. So this.
steps taken. When you look at now the way we're living, and you look at the system, we were just talking a minute ago about the, uh, Sunday when we, when we was in class, <laughs> how we was talking about how oh, Don is broke, he ain't got no money. Right? I about that today. I sure uh, and then, <laughs> like clockwork, man. Clockwork, like it, clockwork. It's, it's like as soon as you get back, I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because, you know, things like that are happening more and it's closer. Yep. I yep. said, wait a minute. <laughs> and then the white folks are saying, yeah, Don, he owed $300 million. He ain't got a dime. And Don paid $750 in taxes. Two years and none for the last 15, I don't know how, right? Yeah. And it's drip, 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 the same thing we've been saying. Drip, 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 drip. But the other aspect is, is what they're saying that, going back to what you said, somebody had to pay him, be paying him, and then you hear that, yeah. okay, being at a, in a position that he's in, he's compromised himself. He's compromised. He's, national, he's a national security threat. He's a security threat. He yeah. is a security That's threat. That's exactly what they said on NPR. They say yeah. he's a security He is. He is a security it ain't nothing. Threat. Now, we done already lined it up for everybody. Yeah. It's the Zionist over there. Right. Right. They didn't hire him. We use the term. They hired him. That's right. He was hired to do that. It was clear to us right away that he was hired to do that because he's doing, his job is to destroy America or to weaken it. Right. That's what his job. Right. If he weakens America, then the Zionists have more power. Although they have a demonstration to all Netanyahu ain't in too good a shape itself. But if he's in better shape than America, this big country can be used, like it has been, to go over and fight what America had to do with Iraq. Nothing but go over there and fight to make sure they don't get low. What does America had to do with Iran? They tried to finish it off in 53. What's wrong with them having a treaty? Right? Mm -hmm. With Iran, the, 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 uh, nuclear. Now, Iran can't lose because the, the rock bottoms gave a fatwa that we can't have a nuclear weapon anyway. That don't mean that the army won't be slipping around. You know what I mean? It don't mean that. It means that on the surface, no, man, we ain't, we ain't gonna, we don't do that, you know. But, you got to imagine too that you don't know what the military is going to do, although the rock bottom said. So technically, they're negotiating about something that they're not going to do anyway. Right, right yeah. That's right. That's I was thinking the exact same Yeah, they were, they're negotiating <laughs> about, we don't want you to have no time to, well, 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 yeah, they're, but they're not going to have it. And then the, the CIA's information said that after they was working on something up to 2003, but after that, there was no, this is what their information said. So they negotiated with, uh, I don't know, we need, you can't tell, y'all be talking crazy and all that. So they negotiated about something that they're not gonna spend any time on. And then when, when they realized what they were doing, this is what Netanyahu and Saudi Arabia say, y'all left the missiles out, man. You guys is big and missiles and drones. You can look on the phone thing every day. Iran is increasing their, their ability in drones and drone technology and missile size and accuracy every day. I mean, every week they come out, not every week, but every month or so, they improve and they improve, so they're getting better. But anyway, so to negotiate with these people, who would it help and who would it harm? It was harming and Netanyahu. So they always saying, well, this the Russian, this the Russian. That's a diversion. It's Saudi Arabia and it's the Zionists. Now, the only
one thing, Russia could be playing a little part for a little few extra dollars, but it don't look like it. Because the Russians have been holding up good in Syria. Remember the U.S. talking about we going we bombing, they, for two years they was bombing Daesh and ISIS, and they hadn't hit nobody. And the Russians came in in 2015, something like that, and they, hit, they had them almost wiped out in about a month. So that was old boss man. Anyway, so we're back to risk and risk management. And the world that we want to live in is a risk for us to place our faith and trust in these people who have no concept. They're going to have a debate tonight. You won't hear nothing about uh, the global change and we got to do this and we got to do that. Right. They won't be talking about that. They won't be, and if it is, it's just talk. Because the level that they would have to bring it up to, if they can't stop people from going in and out of restaurants and going to school, they definitely not gonna be able to say, we gotta freeze this thing. We gotta have food, we're gonna produce food. We're not gonna produce no more nothing. No more cars, no more this, no more that. Till we clean this thing up. We'll clean it up. They don't have, they're not even thinking about that. But that's what's what's need to be done. Anyway. Uh, as far as other people's groups are concerned, uh, technically, uh, Iranians, Shias in general, Indo-Pak, African Americans. We've had a very, it's been a very, not fruitful, but it's been a good experience. Now remember, I experienced it before. Heavily involved in drugs, well, in some of them, but supporting the whole black movement, you know, supporting the black movement. They, the government didn't expect us to do that. They expected that we get the Negro in the drug, getting, dealing with drugs. And, and the first time they arrested me, they were searching everything, doing this and that. Now, first of all, it was illegal what they did. But they said to each other, this one is different, because I have bank accounts and all that before I got worldwide. So, you know, so he saves his money. So. They was not looking just for no drugs. They was looking to see the habits, customs. Then, when I tried to take a little retirement at that time, here they come with all the big connections. Now, you know what makes you big in that is you have access to everything. So I remember where all Contacts came from. I remember who brought them. I remember all of that. And when I go back and back, it's always the same. It's boss man. Yes, it is. Boss man was my connection. All the time and every time. You know, that was, you know, and I, I didn't have nothing against it because, you know, you're looking for it and hear boss man come with it. Always a good old friend, though, that you knew way back when to just point you in that direction and then they disappear. You don't see them again. Of course, the last time I saw this guy was when I snuck back in the country. I was ready to turn myself in. I was at the San Francisco airport and I had a beard like now, with bushy hair. Before, I was always clean cut. He sat down right next to me. So I asked him the dumbest question in the world. I said, so you know who I am? And we grew up together and everything. And I don't even know him anymore. But that let me know, thinking about, back about it, he's the one that pointed me to the white boys two, three years earlier 
and he was the police, and they knew I was back in the country, and he's there to identify me, to say, yep, that's him. You know, when you get a chance, when you survive a long time, and you have all this time to put everything together, you don't need no new experiences, because all of that stuff that happened, it all fits. So anyway, with the African experience, the South American experience, and when we get a chance to rest and go into the penitentiary and come out as an imam in 1980, go back for a minute, and y'all remember the little writing that they had. We don't want you to go back home and start your Muslim church. We want you to get a job. And da 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 I said, these people are really crazy. You know, and the reason I went back was illegal. It didn't really happen, you know. But the environmental circumstances, the revolution was just happened in Iran, and that was a whole environment. Uh, the Islamic movement amongst African Americans was uh, kind of, people was hopeful. That was during the days when Imam Wajdeen Muhammad gave his lecture in Philadelphia, Remake the World, of course I was a little early in 76. Remake the world, just what was needed. Right now, remake the world. And the dog was still going, and everything, the, the point I'm making, everything that happened to me personally did not divert me from the movement. It helped me get more involved in the movement. Even when I was in California, not California, I was in a prison, Magnell Island, it's kind of like Alcatraz, stuff is up in Washington. And everybody from California and all that go there. Well, I knew everybody in California, and da, 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 da. And the warden, for some reason, the deputy warden, he had a meeting with, the, with us. I was a captain, another brother was a secretary, another was a minister. And the deputy warden, they used to call him John Wayne, because when well, he was a terrible Indiana, he walked out in the yard and went riding. It was supposed to be bad. He was standing there and he said, Now nah, I want y'all 